It's punk rock bowling time. That's right. For the 24th year, one of the greatest festivals on earth, in my opinion, returns to downtown Las Vegas the weekend of May 25th, 26th, and 27th. I have had some of my greatest times playing this thing and just hanging out of this thing. You want to know how much this festival speaks to Turnout of Punk's mindset? The headliners are Devo, Descendants, and Madness. Every day of this festival, the lineup is stacked with amazing bands of all types and stripes of punk and hardcore from all different eras, from ska to post-hardcore. We're talking like Bratmobile to Rock from the Crypt to Stiff Little Fingers to the Cosmic Psychos to Scowl to Chad. I just... And then there's also all these late night after shows which are happening. And you wouldn't believe the lineup of these things from the Zeros to Agnostic Front and everything in between, this festival is out of control for fans of punk. Uh, so I hope I will see you there. Because this isn't like some sort of festival that you just go to and the bands are secluded in some sort of backstage area. Bands and fans and just punks alike are all just taking over downtown Las Vegas. So you turn around and all of a sudden you're gambling beside John Doe from X. I don't, I don't know if John Doe gambles but if you turn around on the buffet line you'll probably see me and you better believe we're gonna be talking about punk music and because this festival loves this podcast as much as this podcast loves this festival punk rock bowling is bringing you a series of special episodes so each and every week i will have an episode going up featuring someone that's playing this festival and hot damn are there some good ones coming Head over to punkrockbowling.com and hopefully I see you in downtown Las Vegas, May 25th, 26th, and 27th. Hello and welcome to another edition of Turned Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham. And once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show... Someone I've been hoping to have on the show for a very long time from the band Scowl, Cat Moss is on the show today. More on that in one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turned out a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and normally guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. And he will get the message to me. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at left for Damien. If you want to support the show, tell all your friends about it. Let them know that we're doing this twice a week, talking about punk music with people. Uh, I play in a band. We are called Fucked Up. You can find out more information over at fuckedup.cc. We got two new records. Surprises to me, even. Uh, it came out on April Fool's Day. So get yourself copies over there if you are so inclined. Or check out the songs. They're on streaming. See if you like them first. Try them before you buy them. And that's it. All right, on to today's show. Uh, this is another one of those very special punk rock bowling episodes. Uh, as I mentioned last week on the episode with Molly, a couple months ago, punk rock bowling came to turn out a punk and said, let's do something together. And my gosh, do we have some good episodes waiting for you. Huge thank you again to Christina and Vanessa at Mutiny PR for everything they've done for uh, putting this whole thing together. And of course, Tristan for all his hard work as well on our end. And uh, you get to enjoy them. And I get to enjoy recording them with all these different people. And today on the show, Kat Moss from Scowl is here. Someone we, Tristan and I have been talking about trying to have on the show for a very long time. And now it's finally happened. Scowl, if you are not familiar, are one of the most talked about hardcore bands in the last few years. And, uh, I'm not going to, we, we get into all sorts of stuff on this episode. You'll hear us talk about all of it in a second. If you want to catch Scowl, they're going to be going on what promises to be like a massive hardcore tour this, well, this month. They're on it right now, actually, featuring Drain, Terror, Scowl, and End It. You can find out more dates over at Scowl's Bandcamp or on social media or all sorts of places. And then Scowl will be going to Las Vegas, where we're all going to be hanging out at Punk Rock Bowling. They're on that, uh, actually the same day as Bratmobile. It's going to be a fun day. We're going to have a good time. Did I mention cannabis is legal there? I have a, I can't wait. I love going to Punk Rock Bowling. <laughs> it's a good sponsor because I actually love it. So I, I, I am speaking from the heart when I tell you that I'm very excited to be down there for this thing. 
Uh, I'm not going to ramble on any more. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Cat Moss on Turned Out a Punk. Cat, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I've been, uh, as I was saying you off air, my brother and I have been talking about having wanting to have you on the show for a very long time because not only is the band awesome and everything you've accomplished is amazing, but I do feel like, and obviously very different, but I do feel a lot of empathy for some of the shit you've had to deal with because being a lead singer in a band, uh, especially a hardcore band, especially a hardcore band that's yeah. getting opportunities kind of presented, uh, you, you have to take it on the chin a little bit differently. And mm-hmm. so I, we got a lot to talk about. Oh my gosh, we have so much to talk about. I it, I appreciate the empathy. It's it's a really interesting experience because you never really think that like when good things happen to you that like it's going to follow with this like really heavy baggage of like bullshit and nobody prepares you for that. I think like you, nobody like really tells you what that's going to feel like because nobody can tell you how you feel. And that's why we like punk music and hardcore cuz it's it's kind of like this thing that is literally telling us how we feel uh but like we're so angsty about it and like wrapped up in it and it's it's so like physical and there's there's just a lot involved in that like it's so charged emotionally um but yeah like like nobody prepares you for that it's it's weird and and also like you almost feel embarrassed for wanting empathy when you have a little bit of success it's kind of like well why would you be unhappy yeah, you know, no, uh, interesting ex- experience for sure. <laughs> it is because it's like one of the only genres that has so much dogma around it, where you're kind of like, yeah, beholden to this thing. Like, like, and I say this all the time on this podcast, but like, it's like a religion, right? Like, where you can't, yes, and and people like a religion have their own interpretations yep. and are religiously vigorous in their beliefs and are and and because like like religion people cling to this thing because they need it for whatever reason insecurity or coping or whatnot so i think I, i think faith works in that way where it gives people something that is a little bit different because it applies to their their own nature you know and i think that like music is no different and like i it's kind of funny that you compare it to religion because like when i um when i first really started getting to hardcore i was like it was everything the only thing i would listen to the only thing i would consume the only thing i would talk about i was an ab- i was obsessed and i i love that i i treasure that part of my character that like when i like something i become like absolutely immersed and obsessed like it's just who i am but I remember I had a couple friends who like when they would listen to me talk about hardcore, they pointed out that I talk about it the way that a kid in youth group would talk about Jesus. Like just, I worshiped it and I I still do, but much differently. My relationship with it has changed entirely. And and I'm okay with that because I think that just comes with age and experience. Um, It's just fascinating though, to see like, how everyone else, everyone's, you know, faith or or their attachment to hardcore and punk and their values were, you know, in it, like how that kind of works individually. And like, I think something that I've noticed over the years and something that like, and I feel like I'm talking shit already. I feel like I'm already talking shit. My hands are up. <laughs> um, but no, I, I just, I've noticed that I, everybody has their own opinions, of course, like we're all individuals, you know, Um, and whether we're existing in daily life and culture or subculture, like we're still going to be individuals. Um, But my point is that I feel like sometimes we're not celebrating being individuals and everyone having differing opinions as much as I was taught we would be, you know? yeah like i feel if that makes sense well like you're saying it's, it is like youth group because it's like it's something so yeah. powerful to get as a kid where yeah. 
all of a sudden none of the bullshit matters anymore and all the cool kids are the dorks and all the dorks are the cool kids and yeah so, so i can see why people get so emotionally attached to it and invested yeah. in it and it is important and it is like you're saying your relationship to it as you get older changes because you don't necessarily need it in the same way yeah uh and that comes with i guess at different times for different people but i, yeah. I it is like it's amazing the anger that people have and it's like and it's for like it's it like what is it it's just like a collection yeah. of like four letters absolutely i think it's it's so it's very interesting i think it's very interesting to recognize like kind of or or at least question and challenge where that anger comes from and something that like i do find a lot of like solace in is the fact that um at least people are questioning things still. Mm -hmm. Like, even if they're questioning me, even if they're questioning my band and what we do with our platform and every other band, at least they're questioning something. We should be questioning people with platforms. We should be questioning people with voices because they have notoriously and historically done us wrong. I mean, how many times have you loved a band and they have just, you know, been this, this figurehead and then you find out something kind of crappy, you know? So, I mean, I do see a silver lining in being challenged in question. I do like it a little bit where I'm like, okay, okay, check me. That's okay. Um, I like to take it in stride in that regard. Whereas in the past, I used to be really torn up about it because I felt like this home I had created for a long time was kind of like spitting me out. And that hurt a lot. Do you relate to that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it's, yeah. It, and I, I say this all the time and I never met the guy. So this is yeah. just me interpreting it. And obviously he had major drug issues and health problems as well. But like, I look at Nirvana and Kurt Cobain and the alienation yeah. he probably felt from scene at his, and I don't mean yeah. scene, you know, as in like scene music, but I mean like the punk rock hardcore yeah. scene. And, yeah yeah the scene yeah and what that would have been like for someone who clearly from what he wrote from the way he carried himself yeah. loved this and it was so fucking important to him and yep yeah like it it, it, it is hard it was really hard to like mm -hmm. have uh friends in some cases kind of reject the band and start questioning why yeah. i was doing certain things i it gave yeah. me a lot of it gave me a lot of empathy for bands that came before me and had quote unquote yes. sold out or or done something that was like a great sin to punk rock. Cause like <laughs> yeah. you're saying, there, there are real bad people that have great politics, yeah. but they're just terrible human beings doing horrible shit. Yep. Wolf and sheep's clothing will always exist. It doesn't matter wh what world you're operating in, it doesn't matter what subculture um, and how you know, how much your politics align. There's always going to be predators and are, there's always they're always going to be hiding, you know, and like, especially when you have something like fueled by political anger and, you know, identity politics so much. So like punk and hardcore, which I feel super passionate about, like, of course I feel passionate about these things. Um, they're part of who I am, but something that is unfortunate to that is that there is a lot of people who are passionate about it because they're projecting and, and think things like that. So you know, I, I do think I do see silver linings in questioning and challenging these things. But I also just, yeah, I, I totally relate to you where I, I feel a lot of empathy towards the people who came before. And like, I think my perspective on music shifted dramatically the last like four or five years, like since right about when Scal started as a band, which was my first band. Um my perspective on pop music shifted dramatically. My perspective on music and, and how it's made and, and the like, you know, the barrier for entry, quote unquote, like shifted dramatically because I was experiencing it firsthand. But I also was realizing that art has like kind of takes on so many forms and there's not a single form that is invalid or valid obviously excusing art that's around based around racism and bigotry and yeah. you know yeah those things but, but like disclaimer but but you know art is is so vague and that's a good thing 
You know, there's, there's something out there where every single person can land. And that stretches so much farther than just like hardcore and punk. I just found my home there, you know? Yeah. I think I'm saying a lot of big words. <laughs> no, I get, no. And I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think the difference with the hardcore and punk is that I feel like we just do it in service of this thing at times. Like, Oh, why are you supposed to go on this tour and stay at this shitty squat tonight? It's because everyone does it. And that's what you do. It's, because it's that's like a we God. Do. We will worship yeah we worship that that's what we do you don't question it yeah and i think i i didn't question it for a while and i i fucking loved the dirt and grime for a while and then there became a point where i was doing it a lot and i my back started hurting and i was snapping at my bandmates and we were lucky enough at that same time to be gaining this like traction as a band that like is rare and and we're very lucky for you know but not to say we haven't worked our fucking asses off for, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's like, yeah, of course I'm going to like, I'm, I'm going to take up these opportunities. This is my dream. I've, I, I don't know how many times I've said that. Like, uh, it feels like hundreds at this point where I'm like, well, no shit. I would take these opportunities and I don't think I'm doing anyone a disservice. You know, I, I like to challenge myself and challenge opportunities. It doesn't matter how much money, it doesn't matter how much, you know, opportunity is there. If I don't agree with it, I'm not going to do it, you know, but there's opportunities. They're knocking. Like if I agree with it, I'm going to do it. Uh, and that's where I, I struggle sometimes still because that's where I, I look to the people in these circles and I'm like, why don't you have faith in me? Like, what if I, you know, like, who hurt you you know and, and then i realized i'm like well this band this artist this singer this guy this dude this promoter like they all hurt you no wonder you're questioning my motives but i think like even even then there's this sort of um like this sort of uh, uh like like i don't know, sense of ownership that and i say yes. this as someone who was on the other side yeah. of this thing at one point too right like yeah. Where you're like, oh, how dare this band do this thing? And then all of a sudden you're in the band and you're like, well, yeah, we want to write a song like this because it's fun. Or we want to play the show because yeah. it's fucking weird. No, literally, literally. And I, and that's like, I think it just all has to do with like how much you love art and how much you love subculture. And those things kind of like don't always match. And then also the unfortunate middle ground on the scale, this hypothetical scale, <laughs> um, is capitalism yeah, commerce. and yeah. paying bills yeah. and your, your rent and like having things. Like for me, it's like, well, thank God I'm making enough money that I can afford toothpaste and tampons. There was a time when I was stealing that shit on tour, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I hate that that is a reality we shouldn't live in a world where it's where people have to steal things to survive and to be comfortable, but I can't change that. I can't quite change that. Unfortunately, I wish I could. I fucking wish I could, but I, I'm not quite there yet. Um, you read, I think it's in dance of days. There's that chapter where they're talking about Fugazi and bikini kill, like eating yeah. beans out of a can as they're watching Nirvana explode on TV. And I'm not yep. saying that these bands should have sold out or whatever, like it, but at a certain point it's like, yeah. it, there's gotta be a way to, there's gotta be a middle ground <laughs> between eating beans and being. Yeah. I mean, I think luckily we've, we've moved on from a lot of that era when it comes to like sub like the music, the scene, you know, but I also, I also think that's because the music industry has, taken some pretty big hits over the last what 20 years it has just declined rapidly on when it comes to like funds so like you don't see that kind of blow up anymore like the nirvana-esque blow up where a band just like kind of overnight is like the capital r rock band um i think it's it's really cool i think that there is kind of a part of being in a band that is selling the dream um 
where you're kind of like convincing yourself and your bandmates that like, oh, it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But I don't think we live in a world anymore, at least when it comes to the music industry, where that is really possible. So you kind of take what you can get. And if you're happy at the end of the day doing what you did and you feel right with yourself, I feel like that's kind of the goal. At least most people who are mu- touring musicians, I think, could hopefully agree with my point there where it's like, There's no promises. There's no guarantees. Like besides like what we're doing right now and what we're doing has got to somehow make, make it possible. I I think like it's incredibly powerful that Bikini Kill and, and Fugazi specifically both like made efforts and and took stances to be like super anti-establishment and like, you know, keep things underground. I think that's incredible. But we don't really, I think the idea of the underground is like, is a smokescreen, you know? I, I think that that side of it isn't quite real anymore. And and the idea of, of, of gatekeeping things and keeping things, you know, sacred in that regard, like that's, that's, a, that's dead. Not to say that you shouldn't still keep things sacred. I think that that sh- just comes with the territory. And I think that comes with doing your reading when, you know, when when I was first getting into hardcore and punk, like I was like, oh, I got to make sure I'm not a poser, you know, like I got to know my shit, not just about the bands, not just about the history, but about the politics, you know, like I'm listening to these bands and they're talking about shit like they're radicalizing me in ways that no one in my small hometown could have ever radicalized me. Right. So I got to know my shit. I got to do my reading. I got to check out all these books at the library. I got to like it's 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 an extensive thing. And so like that doesn't shouldn't die i think that's very important and that's where i'm like yes gatekeeping like make sure that these people are actually like learning about this because i feel like that's you know that's an important part of it that's a special experience when you're a kid and you're like diving into it your first hardcore band and you're like no way jello biafra did that you know like it's like it's it's mind blowing. It's it's very magical, and that's the part of it that feels religious. Um, just to circle back, but but yeah, no, I I just I think that like the sacredness of the underground is is kind of like no longer. We have TikTok. Like bands blow up on TikTok in a day. Mm-hmm. Bands that don't have you know more than two recordings, and it's like on Bandcamp and Spotify. I, it's just different now. Yeah, it's really different. Like I don't think <laughs> I don't think you need to blow up in the way that you used to to make it, right? Like there's so many artists yeah. that Yeah. Like Suicide Boys is bigger than most of these, you know, giant artists at this point in terms of ticket sales and everything. Yeah. And they're It's crazy. And it's not mainstream at all. It's cuz they started their own scene. Mm-hmm. That's the thing is like, I think that it's so like, everything has grown so much, like in the sense of like, I guess the way I'm trying to word this is, I feel like, I feel like, uh, first of all, right now, I feel like the way I'm talking, I'm like, I know everything about music. (laughs) And I just want to say, I do not know everything about music. No one does. I'm really, I'm really good at pretending like I do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've got 500 episodes of me pretending I know this shit. So don't worry. That's so sick. That, you know what? Godspeed. (laughs) That's so fire. Um, But no, I just, I feel like something like Suicide Boys, it's like they created their own underground. Like they were a group that was like, when you got into them, I, I had friends who were into them. I I, I know some songs. Uh, when I got into Suicide Boys, I was like, "Oh, like this is like a like young people my age who smoke weed and party and like are into goth shit like this, right?" Like that was like kind of how I I interpreted it. And they are now massive because they are their own scene. They cr- cultivated a fan, uh, like a fan culture within their own band. Mm-hmm. It's like, I feel like music has shifted so much where like in the, at least since the age of the internet, like you kind of have like within subculture, bands have their own culture and their own like really devout fans. And that's to me, that's that's cool. That's cool as fuck. Yeah, like the ICP model over the 
yeah other bands from that era kind of model where you like you don't rely on these outlets which could disappear right like the the, the website or yeah. the music channel but if you build your own thing mm -hmm. like you're saying like it, no one can kill it yeah yeah exactly and i think that's very powerful stuff i think that's a very powerful thing to think about when when you're in a band and you're like trying to cultivate this connection with fans like because that's something i when i started to step more into like busy touring life and like talking with more quote-unquote industry people they were like oh the fans the fans and i was like what like to me it's the scene mm. like to me the fans quote-unquote like feels like I am above them and I never when I got into hardcore and punk and like DIY shows the 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 reason I had the ability to enter that was because there was no barrier like there was no like I'm a fan like I liked the music I was a fan of the music but I wasn't like I didn't meet people in my friends or I didn't make friends with people in bands I liked by being like by them looking at me as a fan, yeah. if that makes sense. Yep. They looked at me like, oh, like, nice to meet you. You're, we're becoming friends now. Like, we're both at the Gilman? Cool. Like, <laughs> and, and that's something I also think about a lot when I, when I think about, like, the whole, like, band growing. Because there will be a time when that barrier just gets wider and wider, you know? Because I think that's unique to punk and hardcore. I certainly, mm -hmm. like, I, I did a lot of stuff around making pro wrestling documentaries and wrestlers yeah. hate the fans and uh, really yeah and i find that in a lot of places there's like a wall like no they're the fans like you know you're the performer wow. of the fans but you're right like punk and hardcore yeah like i still and that's also like if i know someone was in a punk and hardcore band like i won't i won't tolerate yeah. any of that like industry stuff of like yeah. going through the right channels because like no no we're all hardcore kids yeah like it the the playing field is leveled. Like we're all on the same page. We speak the same language. We operate in the same culture, you know? And so like, I do, I do also think like, I, I guess pulling it back to like, you know, people questioning my band or, or questioning a band because of their success. I think part of that is feeling like that distance grows stronger. Like as Scal gets bigger, maybe, right? bigger venues higher ticket sales barriers at shows literal literal metal barriers yes. like six foot <laughs> stages right like it gets bigger and bigger like the distance is there more and more like the opportunity at, of, to feel community does dissipate in a lot of ways at least in regards to hardcore and punk and that's where i look at like suicide boys and i'm like okay but they created their own community where like the fans can talk to each other and cultivate that um I've never talked with the Suicide Boys personally, but I, I I bet I could learn a lot about what we're talking about from them just in conversation because I, I think it is very fascinating to think about all of those changes and shifts and why people are so, you know, in the scene are so adverse to them. And, you know, I'm not like a big devil's advocate advocate kind of person. I'm more like a... I see both sides kind of person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like um, the matrix. It's all like cyclical yes. and yes. one generation's most despised band is the next generation's influential band because they were played everywhere. By all means. And by all means. I, I see that in hardcore. I see that in punk. I see that in like general rock music, mm -hmm. you know, it's so cyclical. I think about that a lot, actually. Yeah. Well, I remember as a kid getting cracked on by like the older kids for yeah. liking X, Y, and Z band. And then there's like bands yeah. that I hated that are now hugely influential on punk and hardcore kids. Yeah. Because and you're like, how? Yeah, but it's just the way it's <laughs> gonna go, right? Like stuff that speaks to a younger, yeah. a younger generation isn't necessarily gonna speak it's to It's just older. not gonna Yeah. Yes. I think that's something also like that is a little bit, I mean. I've been avoiding this part of the, the conversation, but I'm going to do it now uh, is a little bit wrapped up in the patriarchy mm -hmm. and some, some social, you know, things that are like indoctrinated in us, you know, in Western civilization or whatever. Um, 
I think that we tend to, we've been taught for so long to be adverse to things that a lot of teenage girls like and things that are like really um, just brutally emotionally loved by like young women. And I think it's very interesting to, if you start to pay attention to that detail and, and how like, well, yeah, if you were a punk, you hated Justin Bieber and right. Like that, that was what you did. Um, but questioning that, like where that is coming from, not like I never was a Justin Bieber fan. I was one of those kids that was like, fuck Justin Bieber. Like, but I do look back and I'm like, why was I feeling that? And for me, it was a projection thing. It was like, well, I'm different, you know. Absolutely, I'm not like other girls. Yeah, no, I, and I think <laughs> like you're 100 percent right. And like, there's a there's that piece too, and that side of it. But I think I'm mm-hmm. even talking more aggressive bands, like yeah, uh, the older punks that hated Green Day or The Offspring. Like that sucks. Oh, but those were the bands yeah. that got me into it. In the same way that yep. I went hated Limp Bizkit, like with a passion, like fuck this fucking yeah. band, only to yeah. have to come to realize like oh shit, I'm old. And there's a generation of kids that were young and got into this music through them in the same way I got into this music through the Osprey. Yeah. Like it- I think, I think Limp Bizkit's a really interesting one too, because like I traditionally would not have liked them at all if it wasn't for a bit where I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Limp Bizkit. Ha ha. And then I started listening to them at a certain point and I was like, okay, this is kind of fun. Like, this is like party rock music. It's fun. And it, the thing I didn't like about it, the thing that like was like a big glaring red no for me was the fact that like, it felt like it represented just jock culture. And I've never really been super into that. Like, I feel like the most that I've been into things that represent jock culture was hardcore music. Um, because a lot of it is very jockey. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. It's it's jock music, and that's cool. I like it. It's like for the weirdo jocks, and that's awesome. But um, yeah, Limp Bizkit's such an interesting one because like what it kind of represented in the '90s, and the weirdest part for me personally is that I got like an insider scoop on it by like touring with them and seeing them perform and having conversations with like members of that band and like Fred Durst himself like pretty much coming out or saying in conversation like oh this is all a joke this is all like trolling none of this is meant to be taken serious and then it kind of like blew my mind when I was like oh my god all the sweaty dudes who like lived this like the jokes on them like (laughs) like literally blew my mind (laughs) like blew me to smithereens and I was like wow that's so cool. You know what, Fred Durst, you're kind of a G. Uh, and I, I rock with that. I don't know if I live that. I don't think I control about my shit. Like, I'm a little too dramatic of a person and a little too intense about the art, <laughs> like, to be just a troll about it. But but I, I really, really recognize and respect the bit. Yeah, like, I, I've i never met those dudes, and, and I know no interaction yeah. with them, but I've met, like... And they're very different bands, but like meeting the guys in corn yeah. and realizing, oh, these guys yeah. are actually pretty nice people. But to me, they were the yeah. the enemy as a kid. Yeah. I bet, dude. I bet. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, I never really got like super into music like that until I started to appreciate the level of effort it requires to be a performer like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't really give much of a second thought to like corn until... Besides being like, oh, they're from Northern California, like go Northern California or like Bakersfield, Bakersfield yeah. like, the the Valley, which I relate to in some ways, because I'm also from a place in California that is just nobody fucking knows, <laughs> you know, um, that pride for sure exists. But like, besides that, I was like, I don't care about shit like this. This is not for me. It's not my thing. But then like, I got to see them last year at uh, Sick New World. And I was just like, wow, Jonathan Davis is a fucking performer like that he's up there with like ariana grande and shit like he is good (laughs) he is on his shit he is a freaking star and like i fucking rock with that i think that's so cool i think when it comes to being like an artist and a performer like being a rock star is so cool because it requires so much like 
like energy and so much like consistent effort like every single day the grind you know like not a lot of people like have that in them not a lot of people have that dog in them you know no it's the antithesis of being a hardcore singer it's... yes absolutely like you you we go out there and everything we feel on stage i don't know about you but i know yeah. everybody that leaves in the middle of the set i can see people's faces i'm a hundred percent present yeah Really? Yeah, like in in like I'm I'm never able to just disappear into it. But then you see yeah. those stadium groups, and I do this say this with all due respect, and they're doing the yeah. same show night in and night out. I think it's closer to like a like a Broadway yeah. performer at a yes. than a hardcore. Yes, stage. I definitely relate to like both sides of that a lot heavily. Where like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like you know the the mundaneness of touring, where you're like, God, okay. I don't want to go on stage today. I don't want to do it. I don't want to like give it. I don't have anything to give yeah. and that kind of feeling. But then you step on for me, at least like I almost do feel like so much more, like I've leaned so much more into the performance side, into the routine of it. Um, not to say it's not special every night because there is like all of my energy, everything I have, everything I thought I didn't have before that show that on a crappy day, it, it comes out, you know, like if I had like an emotional time, I usually play like a crazy show when I like cried that day, had a rough time, was bummed about something, got into like a verbal thing, like an argument with someone or whatever. Like I usually play a crazy fucking show, but every show feels like I kind of like almost black out a little bit. I, I make eye contact with people. I interact with people. I, you know, give them myself or a version of myself, but it's a bit different for me where like, I do feel like I'm kind of like stepping into this body that does, that doesn't exist outside of the stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I'm on tour a lot, which you know what that's like, uh, it does sometimes feel like I get on stage and it's like, I'm doing the routine. I don't love that feeling, but I also do love when I know I've been like, I'm tour tight and like, I'm going to fucking rock this shit. I'm going to go on and I am the fucking rock star. Like I, uh, I don't feel that way about anything else. I don't feel that way when I'm cooking breakfast, <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's yeah. something very different. It's something very different. I mean, like, like I really noticed it when I was on tour, we did like an opening slot with the Foo Fighters years ago. Yeah. And wow. It was wild. That's so fucking cool. It's like, that's crazy actually i didn't know that it was, it was tenacious d and the foo fighters and us and it was like yeah it was ridiculous it was like i woke up that's so i woke up one day and i looked in the mirror in the hotel room and i said this is the peak of your career it's not gonna get any better than this and i was right that was 100 percent the best day ever in new zealand that mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. and uh but like on that tour like i'd watch them play and yeah. they never like the show was always incredible like it was never like more intense yes. because they were having a bad day or a little sloppy because yeah. they were having a bad, at least if it was, it never came across. Yeah. But yeah. But then you think about it, like there's like 30,000 people that yep. their happiness is depending on that show being yes. that awesome that night. Right. Like they looked forward to that show like for months, months and like it's spent, crazy. And, it, and it, they all sung the words, like seeing that many people, it was mm -hmm. like, once again, it was like a religious experience, like watching people like, yes. and dude, it's church. It's mass. It's mass for these people. And for yeah. like, for you to go out there and fuck it up, like that's a lot of like, you, you can't do that at that level. And no. so, yeah, like, I don't know if I'd ever want to have that kind of pressure. I like the freedom of, yeah. of going yeah. out there. And if it's a bad show, people get a story out of it. It's not going to ruin yeah. someone's life type thing. But. I th I think that's a, that's such a cool perspective because I, I am so like I, I have I just I live under pressure I put myself under the pressure I think it might be an ADHD thing like I don't fucking know but like I, I have learned to love it and like exist in that environment but it also fucking sucks and makes me want to like get the fuck out mm -hmm. you know like it it's challenging I think like falling it's kind of weird for me personally because, or it feels weird because there was a time where I fell in love with the looseness of, of hardcore and punk. 
And I still very much fuck with that. Um, but I kind of have fallen in love a lot with the art of performance and the, in that side of it. And like, there's a person there for me personally, who like when I'm on stage and I lock in, like I I've never experienced that person in my life, like outside of that space. And I'm just like, who the fuck is she? Like, where did the confidence come from? <laughs> like, that's crazy. Um, and like almost like I, I seek the thrill. It's like, I don't really give a fuck if there's five people in a room or 50,000. I just want to play that fucking perfect set. And like, you know, for me vocally, like deliver, you know, yeah. fucking deliver something that like hits someone in the chest, you know? Yeah. Like I used to take these anti-anxiety pills um, for years and I, and I would take uh, yeah. out of vans. And if I went, took them too. Oh yeah. You know, if I took them too close to stage time, it numbs your voice. So I couldn't yeah. get my voice to sound right. And you know what this is like. <sighs> Oh my gosh. It, 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 yeah. It, it fucked with things so hard and just was Yeah. Like you're talking about the pressure thing. And and obviously I think you have to deal with an extra level of bullshit that I never had to deal with. But yeah, I think there's also something that comes from being the lead singer in a band. And yes. Uh yes. There's this guy, Gord Downey. He sang in this band called The Tragically Hip here, one of the biggest Canadian mm. bands of all time. And uh, see i need to do some reading on my canadian it, canadian reading it's deep this is deep canadiana but like they yeah. they would play in america and it'd be like 700 people but they would all just be canadians yeah. or friends of canadians coming to see them type thing but they play stadiums up oh. here and gord yeah. went to, uh, he sang on a record with us and and i and he told me like you know as the lead singer you will have to wear it differently and no one in your band yes. will understand what you're going yes. through and it's different it like, sucks yeah it sucks like no one in the band gets it <laughs> it sucks in that way right yeah it's it's one of those things that becomes like for me like every time that i think it's getting easier something else happens some sort of situation arises some sort of like some shit flies my way like that reminds me like it only gets harder as the as things grow and as the pressure builds it does only get harder in some regards and like having a tight relationship with your band is so important so you feel supported through it um i struggle because like not only is there that alienation of like oh i'm the singer and like i bear all this weird psychological weight right um but i also reap the most benefits so it's like this like really challenging double-edged sword but it's also like I'm this girl surrounded by a bunch of boys and they all love me and they all make me feel welcome. And I fucking love them. They're my best friends. They're my brothers, but there's still that, that alienation. There's still that difference there that like is inexplainable in a lot of ways. And them being able to understand, like they will never, that they will never truly get it helps a lot just to make me feel valid. Like, okay, you know, I'm alone. <laughs> like, yeah. okay you're going to try and make me feel as not alone as possible. Thank you. But um, the lead singer pressure is fucking weird, dude. It's fucked up. And it's fucked up because like, you don't, like I said earlier, like as time goes, I, I think it's going to get a little easier and it just gets harder. Like new things happen where I'm like, Oh, it's different for me. And I stand alone on this Island and uh, it fucking sucks to be on that Island sometimes. Sometimes I want to just, I wish I had like in crazy, like incredible bass uh, abilities. So I could just be like, you know, the guy on the bass, like yeah. that'd be fun. Like just, just to be able to have that experience, a taste of it, you know? Well, cause I think Walk a day in those shoes. <laughs> well, exactly. Like there's like, um, I think it's the who in one of the who documentaries, mm. they're talking about how they all had their instruments to kind of protect them. Yeah. Like as a shield, like the yeah. guitar or the bass or the drum set. Yeah. Whereas when you're a lead singer, you're exposed and you can't retreat. You only have it. yourself. Yeah. Like you can't. No. Like, anything you do is picked up by the audience. Like you're like you're saying, if you're having yeah. a bad day, they're gonna feel it. They're gonna know it if you don't Dude. work on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I. It's kind of funny actually, bringing up the the bad day scenario is like. For me, it's it's been so important. Like I'm, I'm sure you relate. You know, struggling with mental health bullshit 
it doesn't go away on tour. It gets, it gets worse, way it, worse. It, it gets way worse in different ways. And it has these workarounds that are so fucked up and I'm trying to learn to handle. But like the thing that has been the hardest is those days where it's like, you know, when I was a teenager, I'd feel fucked up. I'd feel dark in the hole. I'd be like, damn, really suicidal today. Like, just like not feeling good. But like nobody prepares you for what it's like when you're like, you're in your band and it's kind of popping and you should be excited and you should feel this way and this way and this. And like, you have some personal life bullshit, whatever, but like you're about to go on stage and you're like, I have that same feeling. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be here. And like, for me personally, like I've never gone on stage and shown those people that I've always like luckily been able to use it and just like, create something so powerful out of it and i think i can at least look at my ability to be a dramatic bitch <laughs> like as as like some help in that moment where it's like you know what if i'm feeling real dark deep down and dark right now like at least i play in a punk band where i'm like allowed to go on stage and like just scream my head off and be a fucking crazy bitch for 30 minutes like thank god Thank God I'm not checking, like scanning groceries right now. Yeah. And I'm, I like have to just like shut down. Like, oh, I don't miss that time. I don't miss that time period at all. That shit was dark. That was so yeah. different. Yeah. It is, it is really, so. it is, <laughs> it is like so, um, I don't know, it can be so lonely on the road. Yes. In a way. Oh my God. Yeah. And nothing's lonely. Surrounded by people, too. Yes, exactly. Nothing's lonelier than, like, a packed club in a weird way. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. It's, um... Shit sucks. It sucks. <laughs> and, like, this whole industry is set up for us to hurt ourselves to cope. Like, mm -hmm. alcohol is always there. Yes. It's the cap and trade of the industry. Always. Holy shit, dude. I think that the alcohol part is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially after like, you know, we're, we're going to be stepping into like the next year of touring, you know, the next touring year or whatever. Um, I came home last year from our last tour in fall and I was so cooked. I was so tired. My, I'd lost so much weight and I, I wasn't really taking good care of myself. I was feeling pretty depressed and, uh, I think I, I, I realized after there, I knew it in the moment, but I wasn't really paying attention to it too much. Like there was a lot of shows on that fall tour where I, I didn't have the energy. I didn't have it in me, whether it was emotional or physical. Cause I was sick a lot. I was, I was constantly getting sick on tour last year and that really bummed me out too. But like, so it's like this mental thing and the physical thing and just like, not knowing where to find the energy to not knowing where to find it and just being like, well, at least I, I can drink a, a tequila soda and like, I'll have some like fuel in the tank to go and rip my head off on stage, you know? Yeah. And then I'll deal with it after whatever. Um, and like finding that to be like a little bit of a coping mechanism and then also being like, damn, like I'm really doing that. Like, that's not like me. Like I, I go home and like, I'm chilling. I don't need a drink. I don't need to do any of that. I, besides I smoke weed every day, That that I need to do. Same here. Uh, that's a little different. That's a little different. I, I feel like I for us, that. I feel like for us on the road, yeah. cannabis, uh, and we have it on our rider on, on West Coast. Really? Yeah. Legal States. Uh, I asked for it to be on the rider. No way. I look at it at worst being the equivalent of alcohol. Obviously I don't feel that way, but I mean, from yeah. their perspective, Yeah. but for, us it's the greatest thing to help us get through touring and yep. and it just um yep yeah like i love can i love cannabis yeah, like same. i am like a, a cannabis warrior bro <laughs> i same. love it um i love it on tour when i'm like so cooked and like i don't have any escape but i can like take a gummy or like hit my little pen or whatever like smoke and like just put my headphones on and listen to some fucking stupid music and just like zone out. It's like the only way, one of the few ways I can come down and just like have that moment where I feel alone, feel checked out from all the pressure from, you know, and like, 
as someone who does deal with like anxiety and depression, like weed is super helpful. You know, I can't wake up in the morning and do it. Like I can't function like that. Cause then I'll just, I'll be a blob, but like on tour, especially like after like in that night, like in the van at night drives, whatever. I'm just like, yes, this is what I need right now. <laughs> I, I think back to certain moments in the band where yeah. I, probably fuck things up a little bit for everyone else in the band and I'm oh like, shit how would i've handled it different if i hadn't been straight edge then and on anti-anxiety pills yeah. and had been smoking weed yeah oh my god dude that's crazy to think about i think like pharmaceuticals are such an interesting thing because i'm like i know and i recognize the fact that like uh psychiatric medicines meds um you know, have changed some people's lives. But I'm also, like, a person who, like, has been it, it, through the song and dance of, like, going to a psychiatrist and them giving me this and it's not working this and it's not working this and having, like, horrible side effects and then being on, like, a conjunction of, of meds and, you know, like, experiencing, like, bouts of literal blackout, like like, just checking out entirely, like, forgetting where I am and, like, I just am so grateful that kind of stuff didn't happen to me while on the road. Um, I, I just can't imagine. I it I cannot imagine. I, I don't that know. that's so brutal. I, like, were you on were you on medication when you were writing lyrics early on? I don't mean to be too personal because um, I couldn't write lyrics. No, when I was no, on, it's fine. I couldn't write lyrics on I, meds. I used to have to cycle off them. I've never been. I've never been writing lyrics when i was like i wrote um i mean I, I write poetry all the time i'm kind of like compulsive like for me journaling is less journaling and it's more like it's poetry and i'm just kind of like spouting shit off and i've kind of give or take where i'm at in my life emotionally i'm always writing a little bit of poetry um when i was more like pretty heavily medicated was when i was like 17 18 19 and that was long before I was like in any bands, like I would go to shows, but that was, that was a different time. Um, the last time I was medicated though, um, was over 2020 and I was experiencing like panic attacks every day, could not work through a shift, couldn't sleep at all. So I, I ended up being put on, um, tranquilizers and I didn't have to write anything during that time, but I remember my, our first tour back from uh, like quarantine period I was still trying to take the tranquilizers because I you know was I that was what it was um, it was what I was on and I remember I had a breakdown at one point and this was like a short maybe like two week tour 12 day um, like southwest west coast run and I broke down because I wasn't sleeping well at all because I couldn't take my medications at, on like a regular routine the way that I was when I was home. And that's when I was like, I'm fucking done. I'm fucking done. I'm out. I'm out. I'm just going to have to figure this out some other way. Uh, and since then I've been unmedicated besides yeah. weed, <laughs> besides cannabis. And, and uh, I've done some talk therapy and that was great. I love talk therapy, but you know, pharmaceuticals are a very interesting path. Yeah. I just cycle off them to write lyrics. And mm -hmm. one time we were in, Denmark and I had cycled off them and had a had to go to the hospital and get like a rehab. Holy shit! Yeah, like oh my god, very Hamlet esque, but going home. Yeah, in yeah. But it was, you know, I was only there for a few hours and they gave me the medication. It was actually an amazing sort of uh, validation for the Danish medical system how easily it, yeah. they handled everything with me. But yeah, like god, I, I wish that was like when I switched to cannabis. Yeah, And I know it's not for everybody. And like you're saying, there's some people that find a lot of benefit mm -hmm. from these pharmaceuticals. And so whatever mm -hmm. works for you works for you. But yeah, like the weed, it saved my marriage. Like all the weird side effects. Wow. Yeah, like my wife and wow. I are way closer now that we smoke weed together. That's amazing. I think it even probably- That's incredible. My mom and I too. You know, like now it sounds yeah. like a, a commercial wow. for cannabis. But <laughs> You're all, try cannabis. <laughs> yeah, try it. Uh, no, I mean, I I get it. I, I feel like I- I feel like cannabis was something that like 
me and my dad had in common for the first time ever in my life. Um, I, I feel so bad if he's listening right now, <laughs> uh, but like, no, genuinely, like I, I love my dad. I love my family. Um, but him and I didn't really have a lot in common for a long time. And we're, I think we're very similar people who just have kind of like opposite opinions, like on a lot of things and opposite views, but we align a lot in certain ways. And, and weed was one of them. My dad started, uh, he he did like some outdoor grows, you know, just home grows couple last couple years and um actually before I even moved to Santa Cruz. So probably like in the last six or seven years he was doing that and we like got so close over it. I was like, dude, what's good? Like let's go. And and like of course I was it was awesome for me because I was getting like free weed and stuff. But also it was like it was cool to be bonding over something like that because I mean, you wouldn't think you would bond with your dad over weed, but like, no. it, you know, it, it gave us something. My mom and I too, like before she passed away, yeah. like it gave us about yeah. five years of being wow. buds. Cause it, it is That's a, awesome. Yeah. Cause it's an empathy drug. Right. So like, yeah, you're yeah. a little more understanding of the person beside you's situation yeah. and it, it'll, yeah. You know, I think we both finally dropped our guards and could kind of talk to each other yeah. honestly. And so, yeah, so. I think that's beautiful. That's so cool, dude. I have cried. I've gotten emotional about weed so many times where I'm like, it's just such a great thing. And like, I feel like such a classic like Californian <laughs> being like, dude, weed's so great. Like, but I mean, I I love it, and um, you know, that's it's something that I I find a lot of like, it's a safe thing for me to rely on when I'm you know when I need that thing when I need a substance but it's you know it's it's maybe not alcohol it's maybe not you know I I don't participate in other things so you know and that's for the better I have so much pressure and and so much responsibility personally and like I want that and I don't want to fuck that up um so for me it's like yeah this works this is this is my happy medium you know there's been times in my past where I've been like mega self-destruct mode and I just, I loved it. I loved to self-destruct. I loved, um, you know, to just get fucked up or, you know, ruin everything in my life. Right. For fun. But like, I no longer live a life that I like want to ruin. And I think that's the difference there. And I, I think it's like, I'm grateful that I'm going through that or I went through that era of like wanting to ruin my life um, before I had so much at stake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like uh, I didn't have this beautiful thing happening where like I play in this band and people recognize me and, and recognize the band and resonate with the lyrics I write. That's crazy. That's fucking crazy. I, I feel heavily, I feel a lot of empathy actually for people who like, still go through that like self-destruction while also feeling the pressure you know that's that's a painful experience yeah and i think like i'm sure you're probably friends with a lot of the same people like we lost a lot of homies and stuff because this lifestyle is is like purpose built to chew you up and to let you self-destruct if you Mm -hmm. if you if you're going to do it yeah. it's sad too because i think we're we're not really designed to check in like i know saying like check in with your friends like check in with your homies like the signs are there like a lot of people like push for that but i know what it's like to be in a van full of boys and when you start being emotional or when you start to talk about like that heavy dark shit of course people are going to be empathetic of course people are like oh i'm sorry you're going through that man but like I know what it's like to be the person breaking down and looking at how uncomfortable everyone else in that room is. And it fucking sucks. And it makes you like, you know, those are your best friends and they're there for you, but like, it does not make you want to open up to them. And I think part of it just starts with also like, I I do really wish a lot of like the men in, in these scenes and in this industry, like would, you know, show more emotion you know like wouldn't be afraid wouldn't turn away from it or like you know sneer at it almost um until it's too late 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. That shit is awfully frustrating. <laughs> it is. And it's also, I don't know. And I don't know what the solution is because it's, it's not tough yeah. love, but there's also like, no, some of these friends where I watch it happen in slow motion and yeah. where I, I did yeah. at various times, like you have like, kind of like even like a half jokingly done conversation, yeah. like, dude, you got to stop this or just yeah. being unaware even of some people, how bad it had gotten with some people. But yeah, I think it's also because we're all so spread out and we all know each other Yes, in a different kind of, we have these very intense, but, you know, temporally distanced relationships and geographically distanced yeah. relationships. So yeah, it's hard to check in. I don't know. I, I, I think about this shit all the time. Like, no, I think I was literally thinking about how when you go on a tour with a band and you like really hit it off and you literally become best friends, right? And it's like a month, three weeks, whatever, two months. Like, you're so tight with these people and you see them every day and they become part of your like your world. Like, your like your brain is like these are now these are part of my these people are yes. part of my community. And then you go home and you don't see them again for like. Maybe if you're lucky, six months, yeah, a year, two years, like, and it's like it's so painful when you feel like you make this incredible community, and then you don't even get to connect again because you're both so busy and you're just trying to pay your bills and you're just trying to do your thing and keep your keep it rolling. But like, it breaks my heart. Like, I I guess it's a good thing to be able to make such good friends and connections on tours because I I would hate the latter. I hate to be the guy who like people come home from tour and they're like, Oh, thank God. You know, but, but, uh, I've, I've been both. I was the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, I feel like the most people who are sick of me after a tour in my own band, like they're just like, dude, I think that's a big singer thing too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're intense people. We can't help it. We, we have to, we thrive off this crazy bullshit. Um, well, we pay for it every yeah, time. No. Oh, sorry. Let me go. No, go for I, it. We we pay for every performance with a little bit of our soul. And yes. Oh my gosh, yes. And it, it, that's exactly it. And it hurts, right? And then like you're saying, like mm-hmm. you get off that stage and it's like a weird mix of emotions when you get off that stage. Like yeah. uh, it's um yeah. like it's joy, but then there's also this mm-hmm. come down where you have to get ready to go mm-hmm. to sleep and you know, you're going to have to do it again tomorrow <laughs> and get to that same motion yeah. place. And, uh, uh-huh. and that, I, that's when the that, come down is hard. Come down is hard. Like I would, yeah, that's where the weed really comes in handy. Yes. That's what I'm saying. That's where the weed's like my saving grace because I don't, you know, it, it's not as much of a shock when I get off stage and I'm like, I mean, I personally, I don't know about you, when I get off stage, I have like a physical reaction a lot of the times. Um, I, my stomach usually kind of hurts a little, like for at least like it, up to 30 minutes, I feel nauseous. My head will hurt sometimes. Um, you know, my body is literally like coming down from like doing so much. I, I run around a lot on stage. I'm very active on stage. I like it that way. Um, but like, it's, it's a lot on the body and yeah, there's like a lot of physical feelings. Um, but then it's like, yeah, you're supposed to lay your head down and sleep. Like the fuck I'm not doing that. I, I don't have, I, my nervous system is up here. It's at like 110, you know? Um, it's insane. It's a, it's absolutely insane. I, I personally found that coming up with like a little bit of a routine after a set helped me tremendously. And it's always, it's not always easy because you know what it's like when you're playing venues, like green rooms aren't always green rooms. Like you don't always have that space. Yeah. Like, um, or, or say like, you know, for, for us, it's like sometimes we headline and then sometimes we're the support and you don't have that space alone. And for me, like I fucking love my alone, my alone space. I value and it's hard when you're when it's after a show and you're like in that green room cramped with like party people yeah. and they're loud and they don't know it. And it's like, fuck, dude. Oh, yeah. my God. Like, I don't want to be the killjoy, but I'm like, I want to scream. <laughs> I want to rip out all my eyelashes right now. <laughs> like, I'm such an antisocial person at times. So um, oh. after the set, coming up with that routine. 
helped. <laughs> well, it's interesting when you trans when it transitions from being this thing that you do and every show you play yeah. is a celebration because you're not going to be playing one for another few months. Yeah. To where right. you're, you're touring and you've been to this place a few yeah. times and there's a party every night if you want it. Like you could find a party Dude. every fucking night. Every single night. Dude, I avoid the party every night. Oh, God. Besides like I'll have like a drink. But like I just want to chill. Like I just want to eat some fucking some cheeses you know yeah. from from the writer yeah have a little tequila soda take a gummy smoke a joint out back and just vibe yeah. catch up with some friends like that's that's the vibe i'm not into the like mega party tour thing like i don't know how people do it i don't know how people like go on tour and for months on end they're like fucking going for it like props to those people i am not that punk i don't have that dog in me <laughs> like i just can't um i i don't know how they do it i don't know it's it's weird when you see bands that do it and i don't think mm -hmm. actually that's not true i know i know i was talking about a band earlier tonight with someone like that that parties so yeah. fucking hard like we were on tour with them and it was just Dude. like this is brutal um it's crazy but like we're not our bodies aren't meant to party that hard for that long and no yeah like it's I, I and I also I think for me the come downs from all these things would be so severe. Yeah, I, I'm glad I never. I feel lucky. Like I'm not looking down on anyone that that does no. do heavier shit, but like at the same time I feel lucky, not for me. You know, I did a quarter hit of acid yeah. before we played a show in Vancouver the other week. How did that? How was that experience? It was awesome. That's so crazy. I I mean I love I think mushrooms are so sick, but I don't think I could ever do like any I could not be high on stage. I'm I'm a big cannabis fan, but I could not be high on stage. I could not be like on any anything like I could I can only have like a drink or two on stage. Like that's it. I find when I'm like if the higher I can be on weed, like Yeah. Like, yeah. Last time we played Vancouver Oh my god! I did 500 milligrams of capsules. We did like oh my gosh! We smoked two. You're ounces. an animal. We smoked two ounces of weed. Up oh there. my god! Next time you're in Vancouver, That's let me know. Insane. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. Please. Let's smoke. Yeah, but no. But I, I'm I can, also not going to be able to smoke like that. Well, Vancouver's like you're going to send me to the fucking shadow realm. I smoke weed every day, but I am not the kind of person like I. I'm a cheap motherfucking smoker is what i am yeah. like i don't need a lot i don't i never have needed a lot i can take a five milligram edible and i'm fucking stoned it's awesome like i don't need i don't need to scare myself you know what i mean i the only times i've ever been like smoking actively with people and like damn this shit ain't hitting is like when i've the few times i smoked hash like in in amsterdam or something like in germany where i'm like I'm not fucking high. Like, what is what what is wrong with me? Like, uh, otherwise, I'm I'm a mess. I can't tell you how many times our sound guy on tour. His name is Justin. I love him so much. Uh, he is a fucking weed head, and how many times he smoked me out with some crazy shit, and I've literally gone nonverbal in the van. <laughs> like, I am just like this with my headphones on, just sitting there, quiet. And everyone's like, "You good, bro?" Like, because I, I usually am just like Miss Jabberjaw. I'm sitting here in this podcast. I'm, blah, 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 but like, no, I can't handle it, it when it's like that. It changed the way I play when I'm on the cannabis yeah. because I used to, I used to hurt myself on stage. Like, and now, really? I, well, I look back on it now, and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like some self harming tip that I was on. But like, I used to mm -hmm. cut myself with a razor blade or hit myself Damn. with the um, microphone till I bled or that's so that's on it. The punk part of me is like, that's so fucking cool. <laughs> and then the other part of me who like is a singer on stage and it's like, bro, that's, that's so much. That's so much. So much. That's crazy. But then, and like, that's you're, so cool. Well then like, or I hit myself in the head with cans or, or just like all yeah. this shit. But then there comes a point where, you're not necessarily playing to a room full of people that know punk. You're playing to like a bunch of kids yeah. and they're like, Oh shit, what's yeah. going on here? And don't really get it. Yeah. And 
Yeah, just had to. Yeah. But that luckily came in when I discovered weed, and so I felt no need to hurt myself on stage. You're anymore. like you chilled out, yeah, chill way chilled out a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I've I my little punk demon on my shoulder is always like do something crazy, you know, do something fucked up. And I'm like, okay, but like how, like, I don't know if I'm not cool. Like, I don't know if I can do it. Like I'll, my, my craziest stage bullshit is just like jumping in a crowd, screaming in people's faces kind of shit or like climbing shit. I like climbing shit, but yeah. usually I get up there and I'm like, yeah. okay, now I'm going to climb back down. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not going to jump. Uh, I, I fall on stage all the time. I, I ate shit so hard on stage in France. Um, we had a tour uh, January, January, no, February. I don't know. Time does not exist to me, by the way. <laughs> um, we had a tour with Madball, which was so fun and so sick. And The Chisel and Tsunami, which everyone amazing, incredible bands, so much fun. Talk about band, a death. band that parties um, every single night. <laughs> the chisel. The chisel? Oh. The chisel, dude. Absolutely fucked. I love them so much. I would protect them at all costs. I, I fucking love them. But Charlie is Charlie is a, another kind of animal. He is another <laughs> fucking being. He is an alien, bro. He is not human. <laughs> that guy, he he was telling dude. I don't want to out him on some crazy shit. He probably outed himself when he was say... on the podcast last time. He definitely. Yeah. Yeah. He was literally telling me, he's like, I'm trying to be on some like Charles Manson shit. I'm trying to be on some Charlie Manson shit. And I was like, what the fuck are you saying? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I rock with this. Let's go. I love them. Have you ever seen his mom's movie? Um, I think she did a couple movies, but she did this no. one. She did this one called ghost watch. And they only showed okay. it one time ever. And it got banned from being on TV because someone killed themselves after watching it. And it is. That's amazing. It's a ama- It's the most insane TV special. It was like Halloween That's TV so special. Sick. And it, his mom got okay. like blackballed from the media industry. Like <gasps> I've been obsessed with this movie. That's, for years and then that's fa- crazy yeah found it was his mom and his dad did all the illustration for the great rock and roll swindle he told us that he told me that he definitely i think talked about it one his mom roughly loosely i was like i remember him talking about like movie thing but i didn't know it was like that that's so cool i have to go watch this that's fascinating um i am a big fan of like fucked up movie bullshit yeah. uh but i just don't know my shit i can't sit here and be like here's my list of like fucked up weird movies like i just like them i don't know i can't sit here and talk about it but um charlie's a menace a menace a menace <laughs> an he, absolute menace i love the guy but i love is, that band he is a wild dude yeah um he, incredible um but you're saying but yeah, you're on that tour that was, with those guys over there fuck well, what's he gonna say uh, Remember now, sorry, we were, I didn't mean to oh, it. I fall on stage. Oh, yeah, you're falling. okay. I don't care. This is like we're fucking we're chatting, Dylan. bro. Um, I fall on stage all the time. I hurt myself. I like slipped in a puddle of beer on stage in France and just like whoop, like, and then I get up and I have to be like, ooh, like haha, I fell. But in my head, I'm like, that is the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. I should just end it all and never show my face again. Um. Uh, I felt Fuck one, if I know. We opened for Alexis on Fire uh, one time, the first time That's we opened awesome. for him. And I fell yeah. off the stage and blew up the crotch in my pants. Just totally. That's amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. That's so sick. <laughs> I I ripped my pants uh, when we played Coachella. <laughs> I ripped my pants the second weekend. I had this big pair of, I was wearing a suit. So I, but it was, it was like hemmed because it was, and like taken in because it was massive. Um, and I was kind of trying to be on some like David, David Burn. Burn shit a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Like, awesome. yeah, it was like with my big suit and it was awesome. It was so fun. It was black pinstripes. It was like Beetlejuice, David Byrne. Like I had green hair. It was perfect. Um, the vibe was there. I go down, I'm like singing. I go to the like edge of the stage and I like squat down really quick and I just feel it like right in my crotch. And I'm like, I like stood up really fast. I was like, okay, like. I don't know who just saw my punani. That was crazy. 
I hope that nobody did. No. <laughs> and there was a there was a point where I was like, I don't know how much is showing because these pants were like taken in, they were hemmed and stuff. So like they were really baggy and loose. There was a lot of extra fabric. So like maybe you know. But I wasn't wearing like boy shorts underneath. Like I wasn't. I didn't think ahead. Yeah, we weren't planning on the blowout on the crotch. I was just like, yeah, I. That's not in my yeah. routine, okay. Um. So at one point, like in between songs, I'm like trying to check my crotch on stage in front of people <laughs> at Coachella, and like I remember getting off stage, my friend, um, one of my friends, like pointed out, he's like what were you looking for down there? And I was like, I'm sorry. I just, I blew up my crotch. Like, I don't think anybody noticed. I hope not. And if they did, well, they got a show. Um, But speaking of blown out crotches at Coachella, Lenny Kravitz, OG blowout on stage, whole penis and balls fell out leather pants. I wasn't there to see it, but I saw the pictures online. It was crazy. So that was that was my joke. I know I just like I just threw this at you like swagger jacking. He's swagger jacking your move at no. Coachella. Yeah, yeah, literally, bro. I mean, I guess technically I was a swagger jacker because like I did it after, oh, but okay. that's the only reference I could make. I was like, look, <laughs> I Lenny Kravitz it at Coachella. The crazy part is like or not crazy. I guess it's not crazy. I said it happens all the time. Literally the weekend before cuz two weekends Coachella uh, the fucking I I tripped over something on stage and fell and ate shit on stage also, <laughs> so I, it just happens. It's part of the show. Coachella was a weird, like one yeah. of the weirdest experiences I ever had playing that thing. Like it really did feel yeah. like. What uh, year did you do it? Two thousand and nine, ten. That's crazy. Yeah. That's a crazy time. It was fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what was that? It was like us. What was that like for you guys? For what was it was us, No H and Vivian girls on the stage together. Okay. And I think Deer Hunter played too. X was on our stage. <gasps> I love. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. So it was like it was very uh it was like very home feeling, which made it feel even weirder. But yeah. then like yeah. fuck, like watching David Hasselhoff walking around backstage or like meeting perry so Farrell. trippy just like it just was like what the fuck yeah. is this shit but man that was only when it was one weekend yeah yeah so i feel the same except it, my experience was last year and it was i mean i don't know if the way they did it then was the same where like the backstage is like separated i don't know if i'm giving out vital coachella secrets here or not um but the backstage is like it's like separated with like vip and like our level of bands like And then there's like a celebrity ultra backstage. And so all the people who pay gobs of money to be on like a Coachella VIP all like use the same like transportation, the golf carts and like all are like operating in the same place as us. And they're all like, where's my golf cart? I paid money for this. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm just a performer. I'm just trying to get where I'm going. It's crazy. This is my fucking job. Yeah, like I I don't know, bro. Yeah. Fuck. Um definitely a trippy experience for sure though. I remember I saw Bjork and that was like god tier experience yeah. of my life. Yeah. Seeing Bjork perform with the Bjorkestra, I saw Frank Ocean, that was also an incredible experience. Um I I honestly felt just excited over the fact that like I got to see artists and bands that like I never get to see because I'm on tour all the time. Mm. And like, I, I got to experience those things and also meeting people who are heroes. I I met Davey Havoc. And to me that that's a big fucking deal. Uh, and he knew who I was just like off the bat. And I was like, hi. Okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> super cool and normal. I'm like literally blushing right now talking about it. I'm like, I can't believe I'm talking about this publicly, but I, like, I was so cool and normal about it. But in my head, I was like, this is motherfucking Davy Havoc. And he's like telling me, he's like, your name isn't really Cat Moss. That's a punk name, right? And I was like, no, like, it, like I can show you my ID. Like, I'm, I'm legally named Katrina Moss. And he was like, you don't need to do all that. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, 
very he's a legend. That, that was my Coachella. Yeah, he's he's absolutely a legend. Yeah, love uh, it. Definitely helped shape for my I was born in 1997 when I was getting into like any alternative kind of music anything that was like a little edgy AFI was absolutely on the lineup it was AFI and My Chemical Romance and then like I could keep going on random weird scene kid bands but like you know those were the fucking bands and uh yeah definitely definitely crazy I I feel like that AFI kind of gets um i don't know like like ignored in the fact that they were like a legit hardcore band and like these were hardcore dudes yes. Davey, they're still Davey yeah Sledge, you know like yeah it, i think i think that's crazy because mm-hmm. i didn't know that like i didn't know anything about hardcore like like actual hardcore punk when i found out about afi when i was in middle school all i knew was like miss murder and and like that era like that was for me what i got into and like it was very like what I thought was emo, mm-hmm. I guess. Emo's so vague now. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, you know? But those are hardcore dudes. Yeah, it's interesting with emo. I find it interesting with, like, all these words. Like, obviously mm-hmm. punk, but, you know, Riot girl and, and emo yeah. and straight edge. Like, these things that are very nuanced within punk yes. that take on completely different meanings in mm-hmm. as they're kind of become more popular i think hardcore is experiencing that 100%. right now yeah i think hardcore is is the the label that or the word used as a label that is now becoming so vague and a lot of people are going to be pissed off for a long time about that and i i have to own up to my shit that i like i am part of the crop of bands doing things that are very much non-hardcore musically um, but still being like waving the hardcore flag. And it's because like we, in the same way that AFI was like, that's a real ass fucking hardcore band. Like we started out as a hardcore band. We'll always be a hardcore band. Yeah. Like it, it's it, with this era right now where punk and hardcore is. Yeah. Well, hardcore specifically, like you said, like it's, yeah. it's, it's having this moment where things are changing, but I feel like that's, it's part of the tradition, right? Like you look at quicksand, mm-hmm. you look at. Yeah like AFI, like you're saying, like there's a, a point where you get into this music and you like mm-hmm. it for one reason. And then you as a person begin to change. And that's where, that's where the shit gets real interesting. Like, like slint, yep. like are all these people were hardcore kids, right? Oh my God. You said slint. I'm like, yeah! like that's, that's my shit. Like, yeah. and that's, that's stuff that like changed who I am. When I listened to Spiderland the first time I was like, I had never fucking heard music like that. I was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And I guarantee you, when I th- when I was first getting into hardcore, I could not have listened to that record and heard anything on it. Mm-hmm. I, I just, th- I wasn't that person. I wasn't capable of that. I was just getting into fucking Dead Kennedys and Black Flag and, you know ceremony like incredible incredible bands that do all these cool nuanced things that are also so fistful of rage in your face and i love that but i could not have gotten into sonic youth or slint or fucking uh like godspeed you black emperor like i couldn't have done that at like 19 there just it just wasn't i wish i could i wish i was that fucking cool yeah. But I'm I'm not I'm I'm not at all like it just doesn't happen. Well, it's and the cause... even crazier, yeah, go for oh, it. No, go on. I was gonna say the even crazier part is that like my connection with pop music changed dramatically in the last like five to six years, where like I used to think pop music was just the and like was just McDonald's for your ears, and it, it is, and some of it is. <laughs> uh, it's that's capitalism um but like some of it fucking isn't and my first favorite band of all time i will go down with this is the beatles and that's fucking rock music that's pop music like that should they did that i don't i feel very strongly about the beatles but um unfortunately (laughs) unfortunately unfortunately for beatles haters i am a fucking i have beatlemania um (laughs) But but no, it's just it's it's very interesting and exciting to me 
when people have these like renaissances with their music taste and with their art consumption. So music or, or fine art or books or literature, or whatever. It's like, you should constantly be taking in new things, constantly changing that diet. I don't think that's a bad thing, especially when you are an artist, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I, I think like I look at people that, have made a career in this thing um, and not, not say in like sort of a financial way, but just like an artistic career in this thing. Uh, John Brandon, you know, someone who's like found a way to never not be John Brandon in any of his projects, but at the same time he's developed this instrument in his voice over all these things. That's just like, God, he's such a, He's a legend, dude. The best. He's such a fucking legend. I love him so much. I am such a big fan of his. I, I mean, negative approach clearly has influenced Scowl, and like, like our early music is like just like. I mean, that was what I wanted to sound like. I yeah. wanted to sound like Ceremony and Negative Approach. I wanted to sound like Gorilla Biscuits, but I couldn't. My voice can't do that. <laughs> uh, I, I can't do. I can't do sip. But, but, uh. Yeah, no, John Brandon's stage presence. I ripped that shit off and like oh. touring with them and talking with them about like, like it felt like I was going to church just once again, talking to him, being like, what was it like to tour in this time and this time and to tour with these bands and to like, you know, make music like this? How did people react? Like, and he just is so matter of fact about it. Mm-hmm. He just, yeah, like, I mean, because he lived it. And, and to me, it's fascinating because I'm a fucking nerd is is what it is uh well, but he's, it, he, he's literally he's so he's incredible he, yeah he is a machine and i i fucking i'm just really grateful that i have had the opportunity to like experience him mm-hmm. <laughs> um and, and and his band and and you know bands like that and i i think that's so special and i really like what you said about him being able to like make a career out of being himself mm-hmm. and and i think in a lot of ways like that's just that's being tr- a true rock star like it's not about like fame or money or it's it's about like being able to like truly be who you are and and like at its core like enough people believe in that like that they're like devoted like you're their own personal hardcore jesus not that I want that, but I just think it's fascinating. I think it's really cool. Well, like you were saying earlier, to have people respond to the art that you're making, and especially yeah. in this art where it's so much of just about our raw emotions, like we're not singing about characters up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even if we yeah. are sometimes, it's still like our raw emotion up there, right? Like having people respond to that, like it's so raw. Yeah, it's but it's like it's the most rewarding yeah. thing as as like a an artist or as a creator to get to experience that yeah yep I, that that's the goal at least for me i know other people have other goals i i've been like unfortunately like blessed with the shock of when you realize like some of the people you've operated around for a couple years have shifted their goals um that experience is also kind of painful where you're like, Oh, like you're not being my friend anymore. Like you're trying to get big. Damn. That's a bummer. But but to me, at least the goal has was, and will always be just like to achieve that, that, uh, that moment of like connection with, with my vulnerability. Nothing beats that. Yeah. And I, and I, even when people want to get big now, I kind of have a different, yeah. You know, like you just want people to experience this or to take it in at the biggest platform yeah. you possibly can. So I, I understand yeah. that. Yes. Yes. You know, it's like um mm-hmm. you got a lot of empathy, like you're saying, it's just like you try and like yeah, understand everyone and give everyone yeah. as long as they're not being hateful. Yeah. Yes. And and that that's the part that is like it's hard as like, you know, I I feel like the kind of person who like will always give people the benefit of the doubt, but there is that kind of moment. Like I said earlier, like it sucks when you realize like some of the people you operate with are like no longer working under the, uh, the interest of like 
the raw connection. And, and like, I, I mean, I have to do things sometimes that widen that barrier. And like, as someone who's ambitious, I have to constantly widen that barrier. Like the one I was talking about earlier, where it's like the, the friend to fan the, like, you know, there's that side too. And, and I, I am not, you know, uh, I, I I fall under that. I, I have to do that too. I, I fall under the like ambitious guys of like, oh, well, here's a huge opportunity. Like I'm going to take it like no shit, you know? And while it makes it harder to find that connection that I seek. And I think that's the painful part about it. I'm also still finding like, oh, I'm, I'm achieving my dreams and my mm-hmm. goals. Yeah. Um, And I think, I think it's just that nobody really prepares you for the fact that like, there's always going to be sacrifices in places that you don't expect. Um, I just, I just will never, I will never sacrifice my integrity. That's like so fucking valuable to me. Like I, I'd rather, I'd rather go and just work a, a nine to five if it meant that I had to like fully hand over my integrity to do this. I think that's, that's my limit for sure. Yeah, like as long as, like we're the ones who define what this thing is for us. So you can't exactly ever sell it unless you think you're a sellout. Like unless you really sell out yourself, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. No, and I've been thinking about that a lot too. Is like the only way I feel like you can sell out yourself is if you take a back seat when you're supposed to be the driver. You know what I mean? Like when you let when you let people who are looking at analytics and people who are looking at numbers and pushing paper decide the choices that your, your, uh, band or like this, this being like decide the choices for you or make the choices for you. Um, I think that's, that's when it dies. That's when you, you sell out yourself. And, uh, it's when, you know, to bring back the mental health conversation, I I've seen myself do certain things at times where I was like, I'm taking the back seat right now and I don't want that, but I don't have the energy to fight it. And like kind of that reality too, that nobody really understands unless they're in that position. Like no fan, no, no kid at a hardcore show is ever going to understand what it's like when you're like, I'm really tired. I've been doing this a long time. I am struggling with a, B and C. I just don't have this fight in me you know, for this thing. But then like you look back and you're like, I really don't like that. I didn't, I didn't like that. And I think people need, I personally, I had kind of a rude awakening to the fact that like nuance is very real in this and choices, if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, not every choice I make is entirely on my, on my end, like something I want it. Sometimes it's something my band wanted something that I don't quite see the vision of something that outside forces pushed for. Um, and like, I get to decide how much I want to fight, you know, yeah. but sometimes I don't have, I don't have the fight in me. And, and that's where I like, I do a lot of reflecting where I'm like, okay, how can I go about this differently? And how can I set myself up to like always be on my own team? Yeah. I think that's, you, you make an excellent point there that especially when people look at the lead singer, because yeah. we're almost like mascots yeah. in a way. Yeah. You take you, the brunt. Yeah, exactly. People forget that there's a lot of other people mm-hmm. that are voting on these decisions within the band. Yeah. And yeah, it, especially if you're trying to be a democracy in the band, sometimes that's not the outcome. It doesn't want. always work. Yeah. Yeah. Band democracy. I like, I hate to say, say it but like my opinions have shifted on band democracy a little bit over the last like span of time i i kind of started there's some things i realized where i'm like oh no no no! like i have to like kind of be the the asshole right now i have to be the guy that's like fuck no sorry guys yeah. you know like and i hate i hate being that guy i love i love people please i think that's something that i've been trying to work on personally like is just like working through that but it sucks to be that guy. It sucks to be the difficult one. Yeah, it does. And but you're the commodity as the lead singer. But you gotta do it. <laughs> and people want to do yes. shit with you that you're like, yeah. I don't want to fucking do this. This is not yes. good. Oh my god. 
nobody teaches you how to say no either. Like you have to learn on your own. And I've fallen on my face so many times. There's so many times I, I said yes to things and I was like, why did I do that? I don't even, I didn't even like that. That yeah. sucked, you know? And, and luckily I, I didn't have as much pressure on me. I didn't have much, as many eyes on me when those certain things happened. But like now it's like, at least I know, I know where my boundaries lie. And I, I know how to be a bad guy a little bit more, but it yeah. does suck. Like, I don't want to be the bad guy. Um, it's just there. I wish I, I genuinely think one day I'm going to write a book on this shit. I'm going to be like, oh, okay, here's re- here's, here's a little, your life hacks to being in a fucking punk band or being in a band at all. I, w- I want to do something with like lead singer therapy just because uh, yeah, it is something that's so different and it yeah. is such an emotional experience to, to be the yeah. singer of this band. Would, like you said at the very top of the conversation, you feel guilty about complaining about it, but it is mm-hmm. like, I don't, there was this, we were doing this photo shoot one time for the enemy cover. And I already kind yeah. of knew that they only wanted me on the cover, but they hadn't, of told course. The rest, you know, they hadn't told the rest of the band. And so yep. they're doing that total don't speak thing where they're just like pulling me more and more to the side and like hey, you guys over here yep. over here and just looking at the mm-hmm. look on everyone in the band's face it's just like oh my god gwen stefani was like, oh uh-huh <laughs> i know i know this experience all too well i've yeah. definitely gone down i've gone down fighting with those like no it's going to be the whole band kind of moments you know and i have to pick my battles um like again it it just goes boils down to picking your battles and and wanting to like you know just it's just hard man people fucking do that shit it's hard lead singer syndrome is real as fuck it's and it's not like a one it's not just one dimensional you know it's not just like oh i have an ego like it's like my ego is crushing me Mm -hmm. because it's so puny but it's also fucking huge and i can't find balance and like I would rather not exist. Like it, it just, it's challenging at times well, the, it's, that feeling of getting. Yeah. Well, and your, your ego is your armor, right? Like when you're up there and if yes. you don't have yeah. that, like it's not going to work. No, you're not going to be convincing. You're not going to put on a good show. You're not going to be you. You're not going to be you, you know? Um, and, and that, that can be disarming. That mm-hmm. part's really disarming. Where you're like, I, at least for me, like I struggled a little bit recently where I was like, I had some moments where I was getting on stage and I felt like I was performing as a person who is dead. Like I was performing as this person who I no longer am and I've moved on from um, and like trying to find new connections where like, you know, I'm playing the same songs over and over and just being like, okay, how can I make this a positive experience for me right here, right now? And like bring myself into the present because this is really important. I love doing this, but I'm not having fun right now. And I, I don't miss those moments of like getting off stage sometimes and like wanting to go hide, like wanting to bury myself in a hole, like just not wanting anyone to see me and being like, ugh, like I wish I could take the skin off a little bit. Um, that one's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to talk about. Oh yeah. It fucking sucks. <laughs> like, and then you feel dramatic too, because like, at least for me, it's like, I I'm like, well, God damn it, cat. You're not like a fucking A-list celebrity. You like get the fuck over yourself. You know, it's like, how, how do I comfort myself in, in my reality, but bring myself back, back to reality, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, there's like whole staffs of people for A-list celebrities to help them cope yeah. with that kind of stuff. And- yes. And, and we're uh, fucking alone and all we have is our weed bro exactly all we got is our weed <laughs> <laughs> my fucking cannabis warrior <laughs> yeah like we don't have really? we don't have that like uh drake level of staff to provide for no. us we just have uh you know ourselves god, i wish yeah it'd be amazing god i wish it was fun Dude, being on. and we'd all yeah oh, oh i was just gonna say it was fun what were you gonna that, say on that going on that Foo fighters tour Cause yeah. I felt like it was like going to rock star fantasy camp. Cause like I'd wake up and I'd be like, Hey, I'm out of weed. And I, I just tell like my TM cause we had our mm-hmm. own TM yeah. and he'd go and get me weed and bring back a bag of weed for me. 
It's like, oh my God, I could do this forever. Yeah, no, I, I definitely miss the catering of like the Wind Biscuit tour and the green rooms and the like. Yeah. That comfort was, I just remember being like, wow, if I could have this one day, my, I'm, amb- I'm ambitious as fuck. I am so fucking ambitious to want that to happen to myself one day again. <laughs> but like, fuck, dude, that'd be so nice. Oh yeah. That'd be it, so fun. And and the sound quality on those stages, a lot of the times were just so nice. I could hear myself. I had all this space to run around and fall. <laughs> it was nice. At, well, if you look at Keith and he's still like mm-hmm. going out with off, Dude. sleeping in the back of yeah. a green room. Like Keith Morris yeah. is like a road warrior. He is a trip. That man is absolutely fascinating to me. Yes. I I have nothing but great things to say, but he is absolutely fascinating. And I it's the fact that he's also just a living legend. Like the first time I ever met him, I was doing a like a video interview with Trust Records and it was supposed to be like me and him talking about the reissue of Group Sex and I just was like I was shitting my pants. I was so scared because I was like, I'm literally meeting. Like I would not be here like in this room. I wouldn't be like this person without this man. So the pressure is on to me where it's like, he's a legend. Like he's, he is a God amongst men. Um, And then at the same time, like he doesn't want to fucking, I feel bad. Like, I don't know how to talk to him about a reissue of a record that he wrote. Like, 30 fucking years ago or 40 years ago. I can't do math. Um, Just, you know, like I, you're putting me in a position here. Uh, That was challenge. That was, that was a hard experience, but it was so fun and he was so sweet and incredible, but, but yeah, no. And that was intimidating. It is incredibly intimidating being around him because like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He saw everything, right? Like he saw everything, everything. And, you know, like he saw the Stooges on the original Stooges run. Like he saw like. That's fucking insane. And then he's still like, and he's still into it. You know, he like still likes younger bands. He still goes and watches bands. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. When when he was, when he was like, yeah, I like Scowl. I, I love that. I love what you guys are doing. And you know it's i was just like keith morris like scout like no get the fuck out of here that's crazy that's that's special that's why i fucking love hardcore well that's because i get to have those moments yeah yeah Yeah, it really is like yeah we're Mm -hmm. like you're able to be in the room with your heroes and become peers with them uh that's fucked up that's absolutely nuts Oh, it's it's why why we do this. I think on on a certain level, it's certainly not the money. No, 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 no. Oh man, God. Well, no, that's that's really the payoff. This has been awesome, Cat. And anytime you want to come back on here and talk about yeah. punk, uh, you know the door is yeah. always open. Thank you. I I had I had a great fucking time. I love just running my mouth about all this kind of this kind of shit it's awesome so thank you for giving me the time it's punk rock bowling time that's right for the 24th year one of the greatest festivals on earth in my opinion returns to downtown las vegas the weekend of may 25th 26th and 27th i have had some of my greatest times playing this thing and just hanging out of this thing you want to know how much this festival speaks to turn out a punk's mindset the headliners are devo descendants and madness Every day of this festival, the lineup is stacked with amazing bands of all types and stripes of punk and hardcore from all different eras, from ska to post-hardcore. We're talking like Bratmobile to Rock from the Crypt to Stiff Little Fingers to the Cosmic Psychos to Scowl to Chad. I just... And then there's also all these late night after shows which are happening and you wouldn't believe the lineup of these things from the Zeros to Agnostic Front And everything in between, this festival is out of control. 
for fans of punk. Uh, so I hope I will see you there because this isn't like some sort of festival that you just go to and the bands are secluded in some sort of backstage area. Bands and fans and just punks alike are all just taking over downtown Las Vegas. So you turn around and all of a sudden you're gambling beside John Doe from X. I don't, I don't know if John Doe gambles, but if you turn around on the buffet line, you'll probably see me. And you better believe we're going to be talking about punk music. And because this festival loves this podcast as much as this podcast loves this festival, Punk Rock Bowling is bringing you a series of special episodes. So each and every week, I will have an episode going up featuring someone that's playing this festival. And hot damn, are there some good ones coming. Head over to punkrockbowling.com and hopefully I see you in downtown Las Vegas, May 25th, 26th, and 27th.